So yes, yeah, so I remember what was the plan of the lectures. So last one we discussed uh, what <coughs> the definition of testing quantum mechanics with quantum superposition of magic objects. Then I started to explain this possible to create large superpositions. Uh, we saw actually an analysis where I that I did which was really general, so without taking into account the coherence. So we will kind of start now analyzing what happens. <coughs> Into account. And then for the rest of, the, of this lecture and the next one, I want to explain in quite detail the proposal of optically limitating an electric nanosphere in second energy to, to perform uh, quantum optomechanics, to, pre to prepare superposition of box states and, and uh, to measure it. And I will put some emphasis on the theory, which is also a bit interesting and it's a very nice follow-up from what we learned from, by, by the lecture of online. And, and then also some comments about even what happens when the object is much larger than the optical wavelength, which is then the connection between the lab is not so, so straightforward. And then I will also discuss the possibility of the, the proposal of uh, magnetic levitation of a superconducting microsphere in order to make it close to a quantum circuit, perhaps similar to the setups that the joint is using to, to cool uh, the center of mass motion. Okay, so remember that was the, the protocol. So the idea was to cool the, the center of mass control of the mechanical oscillator to the ground stage, open the, the trap, let it expand. That was the key resource. In terms of matter very little ground, is the fact that we can start from a pure state. Then the idea to, to make a next square measurement so that you collapse the wave function into x and minus x, depending on the result. And then you see the coherence. So now we want to, to account for the coherence. What's the limitations uh, in the Okay, so I, I recall we had this slide about position organization types of coherence or diffusion, like also what Peter discovered and also found in IRIS with the emission of photons or light scattering. But basically what does it diffuse, but if you look at the at the <coughs> at the density matrix in the frequency, the of the diagonal of density decay is not actually. And they decay scattering of air molecules, black body radiation, or even collapse model. And the way it decays is with this function that first scales, and I'm just reviewing because I'm thinking about this part of this all the time. This, this uh, decay function first scales quadratically with the, the coherent length which you are looking at. So the longer the coherence, the more it decays, the of the diagonal terms. But at some point it saturates. It saturates when the existence is above some, some length scale that typically is related to wavelength, for instance, of the scattering particles, okay, because each of the events already destroys the outer diagonal the terms. And then we will have these two regimes, short distance, long distance uh, uh, regimes for, for the this wave function, uh, for this decay rate function, and then there is this lambda parameter, which is the constant proportionality of x squared, and just the frequency when it saturates. Yeah. And then in the short distance limit, this is a very well known master equation. Uh, actually Gaussian, you can solve analytically. And for instance, you can calculate, uh, um, yeah, so, and you can calculate, for instance, the mean values that you will have for the position and the momentum. And actually, this does not create any damping, and therefore the mean, the mean value of x and p is the same, as there would not be coherence, but the effect you see in, in, the, in the fluctuations in position and momentum, which is the future. Okay? So the fluctuations in x, they there is a contribution given by the Schrodinger equation, so the three dynamics, typical one, plus an additional term that goes as t to the three. Okay. This depends on the really uh, coherence parameter. The, the Schrodinger scaling will go by t to the two, and then you have an extra power. And in momentum, you, uh, usually the momentum does not evolve in three dynamics, but due to the diffusion, it does uh, with a, with a constant in We have to be sure that actually the two wave packets that we prepared here are coherent. They are not just pictures. 
right? Because we want to know that this is going to be a quantum space that not just a density matrix with some probability of the state on the left and some probability of the state on the right. So we have to deal with it. And therefore, what we need is that the size of the slit is actually smaller than, 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 the, than the terms which are still non-zero in the, in the density matrix. Of the so that the computer length of the waste package is larger than the size of the of the It's larger than the, the length of the of the seeds. Okay, it's clear. And as we did, then we will be able to compute it uh, with the master equation, and then this will give us some predictive condition of the size of the And then the second step is that of course now when it falls, if there is incoherence, you know the fact is that you start to, to blur. The, the interference pattern, and at some point the visibility will decrease. And actually, you can compute, uh, you can obtain what's the visibility, and this decays exponentially time with a parameter that depends on the source of the computer. Okay, so this is how, how this will happen. In particular, note that we can compute the correlation uh, distance for this expression here, this, this density matrix. So we determine that in the density matrix for any given. Then any given time t can be computed okay, using the master equation. And for example, if you are in the short distance limit, it just decays exponentially with some length scale, which is the coherent length. It can actually, it, it can be expressed, since all these are Gaussian parameters in this case, this is the this expression here is, is, can be obtained by just computing the, the, the moments of x. And then you, you know how the computer <coughs> increases in time. So you see that then this means that at, at a given time, there will be the maximum coherent length will be given basically by this parameter. Okay. And then actually what happens, the dynamics are, are, very, are very nice. So what happens is that if now you compute what's, uh, how this coherent length scales with time, so first it grows, as it should, because this is just uh, even or the unitary evolution due to the Schrodinger equation in three dynamics, which just expands the wave function and, and the coherence with it. But at some point, uh, standard uh, decoherence enters into play and it starts to reduce the coherence level. Okay, so first it grows and then the coherence, the coherence enters into play and decays. And then you have these T-max here that you can evaluate the actually the, the T-max and what the maximum. What we will always think is that our superposition has to be always smaller than this coherent length, otherwise it will not be a coherent superposition. <coughs> the second one is that the interference pattern, the visibility decreases, uh, so decreases exponentially in time, and actually if, if the source of the coherence is of the short distance time, then it, it scales basically with the superposition size to, to the square, okay, so meaning that the larger the superposition, the faster it will make the freedom pattern to work. Okay. Whereas if the superposition size is larger than, than this uh, length scale that limits the two uh, two behaviors in the decay rate of this position of position in the freedom time, then it just does not depend on it. It separates to these values. <coughs> but the point here. So this will be, this is for instance actually, uh, this is imagine you have a sphere that it has 50 nanometers and it's a, a 300 thing here. So this plot of particle is, it has 200 calories. Okay. So then it, it is falling, and while it's falling it emits, uh, it emits photons. And this creates some decoherence. Okay. Okay. So then the waste packet grows, but the coherence first grows, but at some point like weather radiation enters into play and starts to decrease the decoherence. So the probability distribution, so the 
particle will still be at many places, but it will be classical. It will not be anymore. Okay, and, and if you change the size or or the temperature, temperature, then the exactly. if you see you see actually here the expression. So for instance, if you have allowed more nicotinoids, so this lambda depends on the black body really on the temperature, on the internal temperature of the of the particle. So if this is much larger, then your G max will be much more. And I just say for the time as well. Yeah, yeah. You see what was a bit complicated here is to somehow summarize and try to put together all the restrictions because there are so many <laughs> I don't know, just to summarize and try to make a plot that I will show you later. But I hope I managed. Because you see here this is already the summary of all the restrictions that we discussed in the previous day, but meanwhile, basically the way I, I do it is I, I say, okay, what are these restrictions for instance in D2? So in D2, I will say, well, and I just want that it's at least smaller than the decay rate in the, in the long distance. Okay. And then for T1, I have a restriction here, which since T2 is limited, uh, in order that the fringe uh, can be resolved, it means that the two wave packets, they have to have time to, to overlap. Okay. And since T2 is limited, if I have a very large T1, then, you know, Limited DT2, they will not have time to, to overlap. Okay. And, and then there are many conditions on the, also, also you want that, that actually you also create a sufficiently coherent, super coherent wave packet before you do the measure. So that's why T1 should be smaller than this T max than it before. And also you do maybe other things. And then all the others with the okay, but let me but the message here is that since both T1 and T2 are bounded, so that's the superposition size thing. Okay, and that's why this is limiting how large can I make my superposition for a given mass, for a given size. And I will and I will now show you the plot. Okay. So here just to tell you, because so as I said before, from, from scanning other molecules, I can do the numbers. So this is given by the the Broil uh, wavelength, the thermal control wavelength, that is 0. That's uh, 
that's remember that so these two important things are just when it's falling. And when it's falling, there is no laser light, so there is no light scattering. So that's why this, I just need to consider these two and avoid them. So these two sorts of decoctions will always be there. Maybe depending on the physical implementation, there will be other limitations. It's actually, there will be. But here I just wanted to analyze with the minimum and avoidable source of decoctions, what are the limitations. Okay. But then, when I talk about the optical limitation of nanospheres, I will discuss what are the further limitations due to light scattering. Yeah. <coughs> and then, for instance, I, I can make these plots. So if I assume a pressure of 10 to the minus 12 torrs and 200 kelvins for the, for the temperature of the, of the sphere, then what's the limitation of T1? Well, I have this limitation due to black color radiation to up to 8 milliseconds, which is independent of the size of the Earth of the sphere, as I said before, that's the T max. Then I have this idea that uh, since T2 is limited to uh, I, I choose T2 to be 0.1 times 1 over gamma r, so the decoherence due to the <coughs> of, of air molecules. And then I need these two wet packets to have enough time to come together. Okay, so then this is limited. Okay, this is the limitation here. And the other one is the fact that you cannot decohere the wet packet, so you cannot decrease the cohesion length before you do the measurement. And, and, and then so basically, short message is this is limitation due to black color radiation and the brown due to air molecules. And this limit is the T1 depending on the size of the object. And then, with these numbers, I say, okay, now I, I will always pick T1 to be in this area, so to be the minimum of these three conditions. And then I can I choose T2 to be also well behaved, so smaller than the decay rate due to air molecules. And I can make this nice plot, okay? Uh, because here I'm saying, okay, for a given size of the sphere, what's the superposition that I can prepare? Okay. And then you see <coughs> that, uh, okay. Yeah. So here, so the message is that, for instance, for a sphere of uh, 50 nanometers, you can prepare superpositions which are of the size of 50 nanometers. So you, you really can put the sphere into two positions and uh, which will not overlap. Okay, which, if you think about it, these spheres contain 10 to the 7, 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9 atoms, so then you are able to really place them at two positions in which they do not overlap. So you do like taking a BC and really placing the BC in two positions. That they do not and then, but unfortunately, as soon as you go to larger masses, then you have limitations. Okay? Not that this is in a log scale. 150 nanometers, you can prepare 5 nanometers, 10, but it still is of the order of, of the size of the object, which is quite large. And the limitations here uh, that matter now, that it was again due to the fact that I, that I don't want to reduce the visibility of the fringe, I want to create a cohesion superposition, such that the slit of the secretion sizes is smaller than the cohesion length, I want to resolve the fringe, even some position resolution, which I think here is 1 nanometer. Measure position with one nanometer resolution, then you know it's also limited because D2 is not, cannot be very large, and, the, and also the larger the mass, the slower the, 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 the mechanics is, and therefore you know the more time you will require to resolve the fringe. Actually, this is a strong limitation. The fact that it's very difficult to resolve the fringe, and this one here is basically due to the strength of the measurement. If I would if I would be able to make a very strong measurement, then I could prepare very small superpositions because then the, the, the width of the peaks would be much smaller than the superposition size. So that's kind of summary, but uh, I hope it's not very confusing. But just for fun, I mean, I can just put more extreme numbers to see what's the limitation. So I put very low pressure, you know, 10 to the minus 11 torrs, and, you know, temperatures of 4.5 uh, Kelvin with the motivation of for superconducting materials. And then you see that you can have much longer uh, T1, T1s going up to one second. But actually, if I now make the same plot, T, so the size over the superposition size, of course you can do much more bigger ones, something like having a sphere of 400 nanometer radius, uh, sorry, diameter, separated uh, a distance of one micron. Okay. And recall, it, uh, recall that the number of, of so the mass of the object goes by this to three. So I mean whenever I increase one order here, I increase three orders in mass number one. But you see 
here what this message is of actually, even though you have this very extreme low uh, or these radical environmental conditions, the main limitation to go to larger super collisions is due to the fact that you cannot resolve the fringe. That it takes a lot of time to build a, 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 you know, a sufficiently separated fringe. And that's due to the fact that of course this goes as wide well as the mass. And the message here is that even though you have a lot of time, because this is very long time to do experiments, if you use free dynamics, you know, the speed is most very great the superposition, but then you know, it takes a lot of time between the, before they interfere and they dump the ice. Same analysis, but in, on top of these sources of decoherence, to put the, the effect of a poss possible collapse model, as the one we discussed the other day. Okay, we call that the continuous spontaneous localization model. Um, that basically depended on two parameters that were, uh, I, I just go fast just to, because I discussed this the other day. So, uh, there were these two parameters, and especially this one, gamma, that can be valued with experiments. Okay? And the best bounds. Are typically 10 to 9, uh, 10 to 6, 10 to the 9 times larger than this planet. So now, if I take, uh, so this is the, uh, this is this kind of thing. So here now, if I make the same uh, type of plot that I showed before, that I showed, that I showed before, uh, but now taking not so extreme conditions. So you see, I, I use a sphere of 100 Kelvin and uh, pressures of 10 to the minus 4 filters. And then you see that the green area would be the, the area where you would falsify this model. Meaning that if you would take a sphere of 300 nanometers and prepare a superposition of 20 nanometers, then you would falsify the model. Because in principle, standard decoherence permits you to, to, or is predicting that you would observe the interference pattern, whereas the collapse model doesn't. Okay. And actually, I can make a, this type of simulation of the model. <coughs> really solving all the dynamics of the master equation, taking into account all the experimental parameters, and then I have this. So for instance, if I make this point here, the dash gray is without any type of decoherence. You see the beautiful kind of interference pattern. This one is taking into account the standard, the blue one is taking into account the standard source of decoherence, so it is still it's reduced a bit, a bit visible. And then for instance, due to the proximity to the, to the area where there are the collapse model, the red line shows that it will be perfect. Okay. Actually, it will be center, and you see the fins, but then you will falsify the CSR model. And, uh, and of course, now if you compare, so this is really, it would, would somehow falsify that, you know, improving many of those minds from previous experimental proposals. And that's due to the fact that, as I motivated in the first lecture, we are using large masses, but also large propositions. Compare this with the uh, to have a cantilever into a zero plus one, uh, zero plus one state, then this is the kind of order of magnitude better. Because even though you use a smaller mass, you have a larger position. So this message is clear. Very good. And what about perros? So taking into account these unavoidable sort of decoherence, can I test it? So as I said, in the blue part is this parameter free. There is this intuitive way of getting a decay rate due to the interaction non-overlapping parts, <coughs> but you have to put it in terms of a master equation and have all your rays in the same formalism as this position localization decoherence. So you can just put it, and then this is not possible to be uh, tested because of the following. Can you see? Yeah. So first of all, uh, basically note that um, this time scale in principle should allow you to Say, well, maybe we can do it because if you look, this is the the, the, the coherence time allowed by the Penrose model. So, if you have a sphere of two, three microns, for instance, that you separate it of the order of uh, two microns or one micron, you have um, you know, 0.1 seconds or even milliseconds. And here, also, if you use you know, a few microns and you separate of the order of, of one micron, that these pressures that are. Would also be in the order of one second. So in 
principal, the time scale would be very small. But, however, <laughs> the problem, um, so it basically we would need that. So we would need P2 to be larger than the decay rate uh, predicted by the Bernoulli model, but still smaller than the decay rate predicted, uh, predicted uh, by the, the scattering of Bernoulli. And it, it seems that there is room to it. But when, uh, as I said before, the problem is that actually in this protocol, the size of the superposition is actually limited by the fact that the fringe are very slow to be built. And, and, and then the message here is kind of negative, saying that even in this general scheme, taking into account an avoidable source of decontinuous, I cannot test, I cannot test parallels. But maybe if, if we design a new protocol in which we increase the dynamics, for instance, by putting a repulsive potential, such that now, as soon as you build the fringe, they start to grow exponentially in time, maybe then you can do it. Naturally, I'm working on, on, on these things, but using the magnetic levitation implementation, but otherwise, if you use light, you, you destroy everything. Okay, so the conclusions for this first part is the following, is that we combine these two approaches from other wave interferometry and much mechanical resonators to create relatively large masses and large superpositions. Then, um, yes, if you're interested in uh, these publications, general analysis and the mechanical interpretation. And uh, then, well, to remark that we can make this principle, it's potentially uh, possible to, to create these superpositions where you really separate the nanosphere into two positions which do not overlap. And, uh, and that in this case, it should be quite feasible to test the CFL model. Their parameter, proving by many orders of magnitude all the proposals for experiments. And that gravitationally induced decoherence is not possible using this protocol, and it's something that should be done. But of course, this should, should, that, that you want to incorporate into the protocol should be done very carefully, such that you don't incorporate the body coherence. <coughs> and the message is because there are these non coherence time allowed. Okay, and therefore, and that massive objects very slow. You should exploit these long coherent times that can be of order of second for, for low temperature objects and quite good pressures. So you have like one second to do the experiment, which is a lot of lot of time. So maybe you can relax on the other. Okay, so now I will jump to the second part, which is how do we implement these ideas. I will not be now so specific onto this protocol, but I will talk more generally. And actually I will talk about optical limitation of the electric atmosphere and then magnetic levitation of spring and anti So, so the message I hope that can be seen from, from what I discussed before is that whenever we want to do something quantum, we have to isolate it very well from the environment. Okay? And this doesn't usually in many years this uh, had the implication that we were forced to use very small objects which are like signal atoms, electrons, which are typically already very well isolated and but we learned from the last years through these beautiful experiments on mechanical oscillators that actually can also have a very large object. <coughs> but nevertheless, we have a degree of freedom which is very well isolated from the environment. So, of course, I mean, it has already been mentioned in some talks. And one of the limitations that typical mechanical oscillators today impose is that they have this uh, clamping losses. So Thermal contact to the, uh, to the, to the thermal lab, okay. which provides this, this mechanical lamping, which it somehow limits uh, Q, right, with this expression, KD by the KD part Q that today John was, was saying. And of course, the main motivation would say, well, let's you know, levitate the mechanical oscillator such that you don't have this thermal contact that in principle the Q uh, is very large. And actually, in the beginning, in many, many people, maybe one that we present this work. Uh, people thought that uh, this Q would be you know, like kind of infinite because it's, it's, it's levitating and therefore it's, it's fantastic. But I want to say that one has to be careful. So this is KT uh, divided into H bar Q, but there is also gamma other. Okay? Gamma other meaning that there, will, there, there can be also other sources of decoherence which are not due to the thermal contact, but that can be very large, such as, for instance, light scattering. So 
know, light, light scattering does not produce any, any damping. You know, does not produce any damping to the, to the mechanical oscillator. So you have an oscillator and the scattering of air molecules, for instance, at very low pressure, does not create the damping. And therefore, you would have a very large scale. But nevertheless, as I shown before, that there is this position localization given here, the trace diffusion. And whenever you do quantum experiments, you have to take the account of the other part. Sometimes we have to be careful when we talk about Q and the coherence. Sometimes it's, it's not the same. And the second one, the nice property that this limitation has, is that automatically it allows you to have the mechanical frequency as a dynamical variable. variable. And, and, and this is very, very useful because you can modulate the frequency, for instance, you can expand the wave function or you can release the object, the object from the trap. And I will show different applications. Okay, so let me start with, with optical levitation. So that was a, a proposal we did back in 2010, actually in parallel, but independently with a group of Jeff Timber and so on. And also there was a theory proposed from, from an operator by the group of Peter Barker. And, uh, and now there have been some experiments going on. Some of them in this field, uh, well, some published results and some Results or comments made in conferences, and the ones I kind of maybe know that Marcus is my idea, collaborated with these experiments on low cooling of the microsphere or also observation of polonium motion with the levitation sphere. Also, Peter Barker is one, and uh, also Romain Pigan in Barcelona with Luca Novoni in New York. They, they had a paper on 3D feedback cooling of a levitating atmosphere, so it was a really small one. And also Andy Gerasi, I think, will, will talk about this this lecture together. So the idea is we take a, like an electric nanosphere, and we track it with an optical tweezer, we place it inside an optical cavity, and then we will use the cavity to use cool down the center of mass motion. And typically, in the beginning of, of this lecture, I will always assume the object to be much smaller than the optical wavelength, such that it, it, it behaves as a, as a, as a dipole disk. And, uh, and yeah, just remember, this number of atoms is times to 6 times to 9, so similar to a BC, but of course this being a solid object with a very high density. So just to put this thing into, into context, it's kind of nice to look at the perspective. So in the 70s, there was this, this amazing work by <coughs> who maybe was uh, the first to, to realize that you can use the radiation of light to trap uh, uh, electric matter microsphere, Stephen Light biological systems, and he did experiments in liquid and even in vacuum. And have this beautiful, amazing book with all the details. And actually, I must say, I think that he invented the concept of optical tweezers, the fact that if you focus uh, a laser beam to some spot, then you would create some type of force which attracts the electric matter into its maximum. Yeah. And somehow this was the basis of the NASA area, and I have this and this is something that is nowadays very much used, not only for quantum experiments, but for biological experiments. And I have this nice video where you will see a bacteria that is uh, swimming, and then it's, you know, it's trapped with an optical tweezer, and then they can feel the control of the laser, they can do whatever. They can move along all the axes, also on 10 axis. And actually, this is something that is used a lot in, uh, in biology, also for instance, to, to have, they take DNA and maybe they trap it from two sides and they stretch the DNA to measure tension. And it's, really, it's, it's quite cool. See, yeah, I always like a lot. Because also the fact that, that now you switch off the, the laser and the bacteria is still alive. So, and actually these ideas were then the basis of, of trapping and manipulation single atoms bring them into the quantum regime, right? And this, of course, is a very successful application. Um, you know, that has the deal with these Nobel prices, especially for laser cooling, also then for an application of laser cooling, which is the generation of BC. And one could, one could even say that also the, 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 you know, the Nobel Prize this year is also somehow related because they also cooled the ions. Or, or, or. So, 
So now the idea is that, well, let's see that in this perspective, since the last maybe, decade or so, some similar techniques of moving objects and trapping, manipulating objects with light, now it's being applied to mechanical oscillators. And now in some, some sense, and, uh, without uh, trying to sound arrogant, so what this field of, of nanospheres wants to do is that we to go back to the beginning and use the nanospheres that were first used by, by Ashkin and bring them to the quantum regime all the technology that has been developed during these decades. Okay. As I said, the features of the system is that the center of mass is effectively isolated and free and room, and room temperature, but I will be very careful when I say here isolated, meaning no, we will, I will discuss this when I mean here. Then uh, this is like doing cavity QED with a solid object but that contains billions of atoms similar to the to the thesis that, that Dan was talking about, but, but here the difference is that you have a high density, it's a, a solid thing. <coughs> and uh, it might also be a potential system as, as that can be used maybe as an ultra high sensor. And Andy will talk a lot, I guess, about, about this in his lectures and you see a nice paper. And, uh, and also due to the fact that you can switch off the, the so you can release the, the, the particle from the trap very easily or open change the frequency is also very well to maybe train this microscopic quantum superposition as I had before. So let me now <laughs> try to, to, to discuss a bit of theory of how to describe a system and actually to, to derive on the mass resolution. And actually that's a very nice follow-up uh, from well, I mean it was very nice to, to have the lectures of Dan before deriving a cavity we did with a single atom because here we want to do the same but not with an atom, but with a sphere.